All right, objectives and our objectives and standards here, sorry, our objectives to describe the process of shaping and chaining and to analyze elements of control in learning. Take a moment there to look over the standards as well, please. And our desired result, how can operant conditioning change learning? So increasing learning. The process of operant conditioning is not just limited to simple behavior. So learning to play basketball or to knit involves multiple new stimulus responses, right? So we need to learn how to bounce the ball, you know, maybe dribble and bounce the ball. And then we need to learn how to dribble and bounce and shoot the ball in basketball, right? So it's not just one simple motion or one simple response. There's many different steps to it. Putting them together into a large, smooth flowing unit creates new learning. Now this, uh, occurs in two processes, and these two processes are called shaping and chaining. So the process of shaping, when reinforcement is used to sculpt new responses out of old ones, it's known as shaping. So for example, rats could be taught something new by an experimenter if they had never done it before, and they might not take that action by themselves. So let's just say for our example, an experimenter wants to teach a rat to uh, raise a flag by pulling on a cord. Now the rat, like we said, would most likely not do this on its own. It doesn't have any real goals or objectives to do it unless you provide it with some reward. So let's say that the experimenter rewards it for any stimuli response that is similar. It doesn't have to pull the cord immediately to raise the flag, but let's just say that maybe it does, uh, it, it gives the rat rewards for doing something similar to it. So let's just kind of talk through this a little bit. So let's say that, you know, maybe we have a rat in a box and the rat, you know, we have a, a flagpole in the middle uh, with a cord and the rat kind of walks around the box and it may inspect the flagpole, uh, maybe walks up to it a couple of times, sniffs it. So to reinforce the rat to go up to the flag to sniff it the next time, the exper experimenter may reward the rat with a food pellet. Now, the next time, or the next couple of times, the rat keeps going up to the flagpole and sniffing it and looking for the food pellet, but this time the experimenter does not give it. So the rat learns, okay, well, that doesn't create a food pellet, so let me try something else. So it may lift its paw next to the flagpole, or maybe it touches the flagpole. The experimenter will then again give the, the rat a, fla a food pellet for doing something different and something similar to what it wants the rat to do. Now this processing will continue with rewarding uh, these small steps until finally the rat yanks on the cord to raise the flag. So that is shaping. The process of chaining. So learning new skills means a person must put various new responses together. Uh, a sequence of response that follows uh, each other are combined into response chains. So responses produce a signal for the next. Chains of responses are organized into larger response patterns. So think about swimming. You need to learn when you're swimming to, you know, move your arms, you know, like the arm stroking, raising your arms above your head and arm stroking for swimming. Then you need to learn the breathing part. Then you need to finally add the leg kicking part. So there's a process of chaining in each of these actions or reactions causes um, the next response. So, you know, example, when we're moving our arms, we know that we need to kick our feet too. Or if we're kicking our feet, we know we need to move our arms at the same time. So they're all part of a chain. We know that we need to do this. Practice allows you to stop thinking about it. So you don't, eventually you don't need to say, okay, I need to move my arms. Okay, now I need to kick my feet. Okay, now I need to breathe. Eventually after practice and many, many attempts at it, you can eventually just jump in the water and, and, and swim easily and your body remembers, okay, when I jump in the water, this is what I need to do. Um, another example or something else to think about is it's necessary to learn simple responses before mastering complex patterns. So for example, if you just jumped, if someone didn't know how to swim or you didn't know how to swim, you just jumped in the pool and started, you know, you know, moving your arms and kicking your feet, you know, you might keep yourself afloat, but you're not going to go anywhere. You know, you're just kind of stay in one place. So you need to practice one response at a time. And an example we have here is uh, another way to think about it is a person cannot build a house 
without learning how to hit a nail with a hammer. So you have to take small, simple responses first before you make, before you make excuse me, complex patterns. So taking control, recall that reinforcement involves anything that increases the frequency of immediately preceding behavior. Now unpleasant or aversive consequences are also part of our daily lives and behavior. We all have these every day, sometimes more than others. We all have unpleasant, you know, things that go on in our lives, Some, like I said, sometimes more than others. Um, and this type of conditioning or learning is known as aversive control. And it can occur in two different ways. It can concur, occur through negative reinforcement and also punishment. So the process of negative reinforcement, painful or unpleasant stimulus are removed in negative reinforcement. So if an unpleasant or painful stimulus is removed, the frequency of the behavior will increase. For example, a child cries or upset or becomes upset to go on a roller coaster. Um, never liked roller coasters as a kid, love them now, but as a kid I hated them. Um, and I would, you know, sometimes cry and I'd become upset if my mom and dad wanted to put me on a roller coaster, so they won't. So by me doing that or by another child doing that, um, you're removing that unpleasant fear. It's a fear. Fear can be um, a negative reinforcement. So by crying and saying, no, 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 I don't want to go on that ride, you know, my parents saying, okay, you don't have to go on it, that's a negative reinforcement and that's a type of um, aversive control. Negative, like we said here, negative reinforcement can include fear or disapproval of unwelcome behaviors. And there's two types of negative reinforcement, escape conditioning and avoidance conditioning. Now, escape conditioning. Let's just, I kind of came up with a make-believe situation here. So let's say that Danson does not like tuna fish. His mother serves it to him for dinner. Danson begins to cry and complain about the food. He even gags while he's eating it. So his mother removes the food. His behavior has been negatively enforced and Danson will most likely cry and complain the next time he's given food he doesn't like. He's learned that now, that's conditioned in his head. If I cry and complain and gag about, you know, eating a tuna fish sandwich or maybe something else, you know, maybe, you know, medicine or, you know, whatever else it is or eggplant, I don't know, just kind of naming random foods. Um, you know, if he cries and complains, he knows that his mother will remove it. So this is known as escape conditioning. This allows the person to escape an event or situation. So this could even be, uh, it doesn't have to always be tied to food. I mean, I'm trying to think of other situations. Um, sometimes people will cry to try and get out of a ticket when the police pull them over, um, and things like that. You know, and if it's worked in the past for them, not saying I want you to do this, but if it's worked for them in the past, that when they get pulled over by the police and they get a ticket, the next time they get pulled over by a police officer, they may try crying again. And, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But, um, you know, again, just another thing to think about instead of uh, food. So avoidance conditioning. So consider the previous situation again where Danson does not like tuna fish and his mother removes it from him because he cried and complained. Avoidance conditioning involves preventing the situation from ever occurring. So using our previous example, Danson may begin to cry and even complain when he sees his mother even remove the tuna fish from the fridge. So she hasn't even made the sandwich yet. She's just getting the can out of the cabinet, whatever, getting the can, out, get, getting the food out of the fridge. And as soon as he walks into the kitchen, he begins to cry. Uh, so his mother won't give him the tuna fish. So again, this has become avoidance conditioning and this reduction of the disgust by Danson is the reinforcer. So he can escape it by when the situation is presented to him, or he can even avoid the whole situation together by uh, trying to avoid it before it occurs. Learning and punishment. Commonly, the most obvious form of aversive control is punishment. Now again, punishment is when uh, an unpleasant consequence occurs and decreases. So negative reinforcement will continue to increase the behavior. Again, think about dancing. He cries about the food, his mom removes the food, so next time he's given something he doesn't like, his mother takes it away from him. It's, that's reinforcing, that's increasing his that negative behavior. 
punishment will decrease a negative behavior. So both negative reinforcement and punishment are opposites, like we were just talking about. Negative reinforcement increases it. So for example, a child cries in the grocery store until they get a candy bar. The child will now cry every time they want something and the parent gives in. Okay, so that is increasing a negative behavior. <clears throat> punishment, again, will decrease that behavior. So let's say a child destroys their toys because they want new objects. The parents may punish their child to their room and not buy what they want and say, listen, you're not going to destroy your toys. Um, if you keep continuing to destroy, destroy your toys, we're not going to buy you any more. You're not going to get any more toys, whatever the case is. Okay. Now, the goal of the parent is to stop that behavior, stop the child from destroying the toy. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and we'll find out why on here. Because there is trouble with punishment. There are several disadvantages to uh, punishment that psychologists have discovered in terms of changing behavior. A couple of them here. Punishment can create unwanted side effects such as aggression, rage, and fear. And if this begins to happen, the child not only has to deal with their child, you know, destroying their toys or, you know, crying in the store and throwing a temper tantrum, now they also have to deal with the fact that their child is mean to other children at school. Maybe they're mean to siblings. Maybe they're, you know, just a, a very aggressive child. <coughs> so now they have two problems to deal with. Another problem with punishment, people learn to avoid people who give punishment. That's true for most of us, right? Um, so children especially will try to avoid the person who gives the punishment. This could be a teacher, a parent, another adult. Um, and if the child stays away from the parent or the teacher, then they can't, the teacher or the parent cannot correct the behavior. So if the child doesn't go to school or the child doesn't return home, um, you know, that creates a situation where the incorrect behavior cannot be uh, corrected. And finally, punishment does not allow for positive coaching and modeling of appropriate and acceptable behavior. So we're just simply saying, go to your room, you're not allowed out of your room until it's dinner time, and you know, and you know, I don't want to see your face till dinner time, something like that. Dude, again, just examples I'm thinking of in my head, not saying that's all the time with punishment, but again, just some examples. Um, <clears throat> if we don't say to the child, listen, you know, uh, or, or the person in, in general, you know, why do you destroy your toys? It's not good to destroy your toys because it costs money. And, you know, you know, if you destroy these things, then we won't have any more money to buy you other new toys. So it, you have to kind of coach and, and model it, you know, you know, why'd you, you know, you know, if, you know, it, or let's just say if you're a police officer, you might say to someone who ran a red light or speeding, you know, you know, if you're, going to run a red light in speed, you know, you could cause an accident, you could hurt yourself, you could hurt somebody else, you might, you know, who, who knows what could happen, you know, you might hurt somebody innocent. So, you know, and sometimes police will say that, you know, I stopped you because you were speeding because it's dangerous, you know, or I stopped you from running that red light because you almost caused an accident. And so you're trying to create co positive coaching. You're not just saying, I'm taking you to jail or, you know, or I'm going to put you in your bedroom. Um, again, sometimes those things work, but other times they don't. So again, thinking about that uh, corrective positive coaching and modeling to create appropriate and acceptable behavior. All right. So uh, thanks for sticking with me. Please try your best in the questions and uh, talk to you guys soon. All right. Our closure. How can operant conditioning change learning? Think about some of the different elements um, and how they can impact uh, learning from operant conditioning, such as practicing new skills and uh, learning new skills. Um, think about escape conditioning, avoidance condi conditioning, excuse me. Uh, also think about how punishment can play a role into that as well. Um, and that'll help you answer your question. Hope you have a great rest of your day or night. Please let me know. Please let me know of any questions or concerns uh, and try your best in the questions that follow. And I hope to see and talk to you all soon. Take care. Bye bye.